Fifty years ago, the world said never again to the atrocities of the Second World War. It declared that all human beings, wherever they live and whoever they are, have rights that must be respected in all circumstances. These were set out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights proclaimed by the United Nations on the 10th of December 1948. They remain absolutely fundamental to everyone's well-being, yet governments worldwide treat these rights with contempt. The Chinese government has one of the worst records for the violation of human rights, including in Tibet. One man who can testify personally to that record of abuse is the monk Paldin Gyatso. He spent 33 years in prison, during which time he endured brutal interrogations and assaults. On his release, he wrote a book about his captivity. I met him at the house of Tsering Shakya, his collaborator on the book. I wanted to know how he survived all those years in such appalling conditions. In prison, the daily survival or living condition really depends on your mental attitude and your frame of your mind. It's sort of what sort of mind you construct, what sort of person you construct inside you. That makes all the difference. If you become a very narrowly focused person and only worried about that moment and that suffering that day, and then you will mentally become mad. In Buddhism, nothing is permanent, everything changes. So that is a very important philosophical thing, even in daily life, to sense that there cannot be a permanent state of affair and the change will come. And so it's really up to individual prisoner what sort of mental attitude they adopt in the prison. Was Paul then able to, to practice his um, you know, meditation practices and his Dharma practice? Was he allowed to do any of those, or did he somehow have to devise a kind of secret way of doing that? Even if your lips move, and they will uh, accuse you of uh, reciting prayer, and you could be punished. It's illegal to possess any religious uh, objects like a rosary, and if you do that, you will be immediately punished. The main roots of religion is not re reciting prayers or carrying rosaries. The main fundamental of Buddhism is what's inside you, how you train yourself mentally, and the mind can't be imprisoned. When I was being tortured, I realized that this oppressive Chinese regime would not listen to my plea to stop the torture. But what I can do at that time is not to plea for mercy, but to develop and concentrate on my meditation to deflect their pain. This footage was secretly filmed and shows Tibetan prison laborers at work on a construction site. Many of these prisoners would have faced torture during interrogation. When he escaped, Paldon was able to bring some disturbing evidence of this. Even I myself were to list all the torture and treatment I received, it would be also endless. Just to give you one example of equipments and torture is the, the use of electric shock buttons in uh, prisons in Tibet. Mm -hmm. 
I was taken in the interrogation room and on the wall there are hundreds of different kinds of um, electric patterns and other torture equipments were hanging. And they had plugs where they recharges these uh, patterns. The guard named Benjo, he said, oh, so you want freedom. He, he took out this baton and he thrust this baton repeatedly into my mouth and I lost all my teeth then and became unconscious. In prison, Chinese will always make sure that a Tibetan guard carries out the torture or whatever bad things that they have to do, they will make sure it will be a Tibetan guard who carries the sound. In prison, there was a group of Tibetan uh, nuns, and these nuns, when they were interrogated, and the guards had pushed this into their vagina, and a few nuns had died of this. Where, where, where do they come from, actually? Where were they made, these... Um, these are all uh, made in China, uh, but um, original patents and things, are, some of these are from uh, England. One is in Glasgow, it's in the factory in the Glasgow. Uh, businessman who just been convicted right now for exporting these to China. And they're still being used as we talk, I mean they're... Yes, I mean yeah, this is a yeah. standard issue to uh, Chinese policemen or mm. prison guards. I'm just wondering what this is here. Uh, this is a, a thumb cup. Uh, uh, to uh, thumb cup user, but it's not a cupped person in front. You know, usually person's hand is cupped oh, from behind, okay, like this. Okay. Two thumbs meet like this, you know, uh, and then they cup like that. Uh, and not in forward. People think uh -huh. that, and from behind uh -huh. they cupped like this. And this is thumb cup. Tightens on your around yeah, your bone yeah. and skin. And if you're trying to, to take it off, struggle. It's ah, tighten. okay. So you have to yeah. be very, very still. still. Yeah. That is cut. You know, I was handcuffed and my feet were shackled for six months. And then my hands cuffs were released, and I was uh, my feet were cu uh, cuffed for two over two years. What kind of injuries did that uh, inflict upon him? Mind uh, the sir. Mm. Yes, it, it really was cut into my flesh, and yes. I had many uh, open cuts yes. there. But uh, later, I was able to make a some sort of cushion mm. thing, which uh, uh, I cut the socks and it, uh, rolled it up and round the uh, metal and with uh, some leather strips round it and that helped me. But even when my uh, I was shackled, with uh, my feet were shackled, I still had to work. What kind of work can you possibly do when you're shackled? After my feet were shackled, they will never take it off even when you uh, are being sent out to work. And I was made to work as a, a weaver. Mm. Mm. A weaver normally sits uh, cross-legged, and uh, then uh, I couldn't sit cross-legged, and we have to dug a, a hole in the ground, uh, and uh, then put my feet in that hole and work that. Were all the prisoners shackled like this most of the time? When a prisoner was first arrested, we were all uh, shackled. After a certain period of interrogation and questioning, and they will uh, release some prisoners, but some prisoners will be just kept as shackled. And if the wounds became infected or you just simply couldn't function, what happened then? Were you just left alone or were you taken to hospital? No, there was no clinic. There's no hospitals, no, nothing, no treatment. So it's up to each individual to try to maintain their own physical health. 
Each prisoner had to look after himself, and sometimes a prisoner who are kind will try to help you. But in prison it was very hard, you know, it's very precious even to get a, a strip of a bandage. That was very hard to do. But, you know, other form of to uh, torture I had was in 1960 when I was arrested for the first time. And they bound my arms with rope very tightly and um, then they twisted my arms behind my back and they hung me from the ceiling like an electric bar. They lit a fire underneath there and uh, then they sprinkled paraffin on the fire. One of the worst treatment or torture I had at that time was uh, one time when I was being hung from the ceiling, a guard got up on a table and he emptied a thermos full of hot water slowly on my body and hold my skin peeled. And a few days later I, I, I had to go to work and carrying the stones and the, all the clothes stu stuck onto my uh, skin. Inside these prison camps, death was Paldon's constant companion. Being religious was not always a guaranteed source of strength. Facing death, prisoners reacted in different ways. <laughs> Many have perished in prison, and how this happened is uh, very difficult to explain. Let me give you an example of story of two different individuals. When Chinese people are executed in prison, usually they are executed of seven or eight people at times, and each of the person facing the execution have to make public acknowledgement of his crime and then they have to place their thumbprint on the document on which sentenced them to execution. Two the prisoners were brought out, and the monk was brought out first to face execution. He was a learned monk and renowned abbot of a monastery, and he was completely distraught, and he couldn't control, he was shouting, begging, and he prostrated before the guard, saying, please, please, and, you know, begging for mercy. Standing behind that monk was a layman who was no religious education. He was told he has to face execution and that he has to place his thumbprint on the document. He said, thank you. He said, today I'm happy to die. It is better to die now under such terrible condition. And he had no moment of fear. He had no hesitation. He walked forward to the desk and he placed his finger on the pad and pressed his print on the document without any slightest fear. In spite of the oppression, the Tibetan people continue to resist. In 1989, there was a major revolt in Lhasa and the Chinese authorities declared martial law, which lasted for over a year. Subsequently, over 1,700 people were arrested and imprisoned. Among them was Gyalpo, who was shot dead by the police for carrying the banned Tibetan national flag. Lobsang Tenzin was a young student from Tibet University who shared a cell with Palden Gyatso in Drapchi prison after being sentenced to life imprisonment for his involvement in the independence demonstration. Nawan Chopel, born in exile, went on to win a Fulbright scholarship to study in America. In 1995, he went to Tibet to record the fading tradition of folk songs and dances. Chinese police arrested him, and after 18 months, he was formally charged as a spy and sentenced to 18 years imprisonment. Of the estimated 1,200 political prisoners, one third are women. In 1990, a group of nuns staged a demonstration in Lhasa. One of the demonstrators was Nangwang Sangdrol, 
a 13-year-old Buddhist nun. She was arrested and sentenced to three years imprisonment. While in prison, she and other nuns secretly recorded this pro-independence song. Subsequently, her sentence was increased to 18 years. Paldon Gyatso is free now, but there are still hundreds of other political prisoners like him in Tibet experiencing the same appalling conditions. In 1984, I was adopted as prisoner by Amnesty International and they started a letter-writing campaign. And while I was in solitary confinement ward, the Chinese uh, put a newspaper through the open window and in there it said that the uh, Tibetans had demonstrated in New Delhi for my release. So I think that had made the Chinese change their mind. And I realized that there was immediate effect on this because when we were taken out, the Chinese began to treat us very differently. And even during the interrogation, they were much more gentle. Which really goes to prove to Westerners that if they join uh, campaigns like Amnesty International, there, there, there can be results. Mm. I think that, that in my case clearly illustrates that. Because for somebody like myself, I find that really heartening, you know, because uh, a lot of people uh, often feel in the West that they don't know what to, they can do. They, we, we are bombarded with information about many, many different countries with terrible, terrible human rights abuses. And we feel kind of powerless. But from my perspective, I can understand, particularly his living proof, Pal and Yatso, whose, di whose life is directly being positively affected by amnesty. So you can say that if you take out a membership of amnesty, you actually can make a difference, and that, that's pretty powerful. It's, uh of uh, course, it's very powerful, even an uh, organization like Amnesty writing officially as an organization. But for even individual writing, it makes a lot of difference. You know, the Chinese authorities, the prison authorities, also will keep every single letter and they will pile it up and see how much support there is from the outside or what people are aware of the situation. And that will make them more conscious of what they're doing. The Chinese marched into Tibet with promises of reform and material prosperity for the masses. They blamed the economic backwardness on Tibet's feudal culture. After 40 years of Chinese rule, Tibetan people continue to live in abject poverty. I spoke with one Tibetan official, and he said his fear for the Tibetan people was that time is running out, and that one day he can envisage Tibetan people corralled on uh, reservations in their own country, like the indigenous American Indian. I'm far more uh, optimistic and hopeful about the future than the Tibetan who you met, because the, the hope comes from many different uh, sources, from the ex outside events. But inside Tibet, I think uh, most Tibetans, almost including many Chinese, is that they see the Communist Party or the, the rulers in China are rotting inside. And it's just a matter of time until that uh, collapses. The world is uh, changing. And uh, when I was in prison, and they used to say that the communism is spreading to every corner of the world. And now where are these countries? They all have changed. They all are now have democratic institutions. And it's only China is that now standing as sort of a socialist country. And the people in Tibet are aware of this. In 1983, I was released briefly, and that uh, allowed me to visit my old monastery, which was in uh, ruins. And that side of the ruins of the monastery really deeply saddened me. I just had sadness sort of descending into the whole of my body. Later, in 92, when I was released and I visited the monastery, I was surrounded by the Chinese policemen and soldiers who were uh, guarding the monastery. They made me very sad. 
And just to travel outside the surroundings of Lhasa, uh, people had to carry their identity cards and that will be off, uh, you will be stopped and searched all the time and they will check your identity and if you are not carrying your cards, uh, you could be arrested or imprisoned. The prison that he escaped from is coming into sort of certain kind of conditions outside that, that are similar to prison. Uh, yes, it's a sort of a, a prison, outer and inner prison. And today, Tibet is prison for uh, Tibetans, and it's a pleasure ground for the Chinese troops. Once he was outside, was he a threat then? Did he feel that he could easily be taken back in again? Uh, I was followed when I was released, and I was watched all the time. I knew that any slightest infringement or something would happen, that, that I would be arrested and sent back to the prison. Every year, hundreds of Tibetans risk their lives and escape across the frozen wastelands of the Himalayas. Many of the refugees are young boys and girls who are sent out by their parents in hope of gaining a better future. Some have died on their journey, and many suffered from frostbite. They make their way to Dharamsala in the foothills of the Himalayas, which is now the home of the Dalai Lama, the spiritual and political leader of the Tibetan people. <laughs> When I left Tibet, I was really uh, very strong-minded that I was going to see His Holiness Dalai Lama and had desired that I was going to be able to tell His Holiness about all the things that are happening in Tibet and tell the names of people who have perished in the prison system. But uh, when I finally got to meet him, it was such an unbelievable experience and all the thoughts I had in mind, I just completely lost and I couldn't say anything. I was totally speechless and I just cried and the tears just flew down my cheeks. You know, one of my reasons why I escaped and why I brought these equipments and is to be able to be sort of bear witness to what's happening. And since I have been through prison for many years, I thought I can give testimony as a living person of what's happening in um, Tibet and in the prison. And, you know, uh, I brought these equipments out because Chinese will say that they, they claim that there are no tortures in, in the prison, that there are no prisoners are beaten. But I have to show the world to them what kind of equipments that are, are being used. Secondly, I mean, it also illustrates the sign of the evil trade that is going on in the world on these kind of equipments and so how they end up being used in prison. Yeah. I feel now as of some sense of accomplishment because when His Holiness, I met His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he said I must write down my story. And in 1995, I know I had, uh, as just being a refugee, I had no means of writing, let alone writing book in English into Tibetan. But uh, later, with the help of a lot of people, now I have been able to tell my story, and I feel sort of very satisfied and accomplished. The oppressive Chinese power holders want you to command and say things that which are not true. You know, the Communist Party cannot command the sun dries from the West. No power, however the powerful Communist Party may be, it cannot make the sun rise from the West. Uh, 
Similarly, I mean, how can we as Tibetans accept that we are part of China? This is not our experience. And it doesn't matter how oppressive they are, the truth will always remain true. Now, now my story is published, and the Chinese uh, embassy here or Chinese government can read it. And if they want to confront me, face to face and dispute any of the stories I tell, uh, I will uh, welcome that. Yeah. Palden Gyatso's experience shows clearly how the Chinese government has consistently ignored the basic principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Serious abuses continue in Tibet to this day, including horrific acts of torture and the violent suppression of religious freedom. Amnesty International needs your help to make sure that the people of Tibet have the freedom to live without fear and to remind governments that human rights are for everyone. We need you to sign your pledge to uphold the Universal Declaration for all people everywhere. I will do everything in my power to ensure that the rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights become a reality throughout the world.